given all your experience and all the different ways and you think about martial arts and violence in Mexico, in the, in the world, speaking of Hoist, what is your approach to conflict, uh, like, a, like a street fight? What advice would you give people in the full spectrum of what a street altercation might entail? What is the best way to approach it? I think before you get there, you have to prepare, you know? So I, one of the first things I tell people is uh, if you don't have a basic T triple C training class behind you, you should reanalyze your your life and your ability to prepare. T triple C. Basically how to stop somebody from bleeding out or dying from a stab wound, gunshot wound, or any of those types of wounds, uh, or an amputated leg during an IED scenario. Anything you would see in a Boston Marathon, a marathon type event or a Vegas shooting event where people are getting shot, stabbed, cut. So understand how to help people, how to help yourself post you, you're no good to, you don't want to be a you don't want to be a detriment to the uh, situation you want to be an asset so build yourself up as an asset for in a situation like that because you might be doing that on yourself or on somebody else and also it helps you understand uh what situations are going to result in a lot of in a difficult situation to deal with afterwards yeah it also teaches you what to stab and what to shoot <laughs> If you're thinking about it in a full and on all the dimensions of it, you know, you know, there's there's all weapon, all knowledge can be weaponized, and I think that's the approach all people should kind of figure out for themselves when they start getting ready, or if they want to take the responsibility of their own safety in their hands. So, in a self defense situation, there's a lot of questions here, but what what does one stab? There's the carotid arteries, which are used commonly in jujitsu as something to choke because they feed a computer, you know? So there's a lot of blood flowing through that required for the successful operation of the computer. And not a lot of stuff is guarding the outside world from your carotid arteries. That's a really weird design, by the way. It is not a smart one. It doesn't know? even make sense because with mammals, they bite each other's neck. Like, why can't you have more protection because this is the only like us humans don't use our mouth to kill each other but most mammals most predators do and it's like why the hell don't we protect this we do have a defensive mechanism and you you see it sometimes when people are ambushed and people try to open up each other's necks from behind if you push somebody's neck forward the carotids will actually lower themselves and be encased in more flesh and muscle oh, if you pull a head back not so much. So that's a way that at least I think the evolutionary we have a defensive mechanism for that. Uh, there's a few videos out there of people's getting their neck sewn back shut after somebody pushed their head forward to try and slice their necks and they survived, you know. Um, so this is a viable target. Uh, the heart is another one. Um, interesting about the thing about the heart and people get alarmed when I talk about this and show it in classes. Uh, again, a lot of the classes I do are for orientation and to, for people to recognize that behavior. So a lot of law enforcement comes to some of these classes to, oh, that's horrible. That's how somebody will kill somebody. Yeah, this is how people that know their thing, their shit will try and approach somebody and stab you to death. This is how they would do it. Uh, there's a tendency to view what we see in John Wick or view what we see in, uh, this martial arts community where they're, you know, slicing and dicing people different myriads of ways. A lot of that is based on dueling based cultures, like the Filipino martial arts or some of the uh, Italian martial arts out there where somebody's facing off with somebody else with a similar weapon and where both of us are agreeing to basically get into a stabbing competition. Mm -hmm. That would make sense in that scenario, in that context, but I've never seen a lot of people actually get into these one-on-one uh, -on -one knife altercations. Um, what we see now in a modern context when it talks about weaponry uh, is an ambush, counter ambush based uh, scenario where somebody pulls out a knife during a uh, grappling situation on the street or when somebody uh, turns a striking uh, uh, exchange of punch, uh, punches into pull, pulling out a cheap gas station knife or a pen or uh, a rock from the ground or a handgun. Most modern combatives when it comes to weaponry, should be kind of based on the whole aspect of ambush and counter ambush. There's a lot of people showing uh, valuable type of material and coursework on this out there. Um, my whole approach and my specific kind of realm is in the aspect of how people 
go from the process of learning some of these things from experiential stuff, people that grow up in rural uh, rural places, grow up on pig farms, that actually get the experiences of processing a pig, for example, or processing an animal. Those people will have more skills, hunters. Those people will have more skills with a knife if they pick it up as a weapon than most of the martial artists that I've seen kind of approach some of these uh, classes where I go and have a, a simulated torso in the form of a pig hanging in a room somewhere. Some of that has to do with just the the familiarity and the comfort of just like the biology of a living organism. Like that you, if you cut off certain things, if you cut a certain thing, like it's just, it's just a meat vehicle. The same thing, you know, the medical training should come first, you know, or if you don't have that, be a hunter or go to a, a, a butchery class. That will teach you more about how to use a knife on somebody else than anything, you know, that'll, that'll give you the experience of flesh. Uh, most people, you know, I, I do this example every now and then where I, have people bring in a, a tactical knife and they'll bring in a butter knife and i ask them which will go through a torso we have a pig there so it simulates a torso pretty closely most people will say nah, that butter knife's not going to go through and it does you know it does go through it's uh, thin enough strong enough sturdy enough that'll go through um kitchen knife a cheap one that cost 89 cents at uh at a walmart and a, a expensive 400 dollar one you know and the the cheap one will outperform the expensive one. It'll, the tip will snap off uh, during some of it. Yeah, I have to say that j just as a small uh, tangent, I went to a farm and uh, just seeing the butchering of meat and so on uh, and the processing of meat and pigs and cows. Whew, that's uncomfortable. Yeah. But it, I think it also it's honest and, and raw and like, that's something that probably everyone should experience regularly. Uh, Cause it, uh, it's also humbling to, to, to remind you. Like when I, um, I had a dog Homer, he's in Newfoundland. That was, I was very close with and uh, we lost him. And I, I just remember that I carried him. He's like 200 something pounds. And I said, I had to carry him and I had to put him to sleep and like, one of the biggest realizations is like, oh, this is just a, this is just a biological thing. Yeah, it's just and then to, to to realize that this is just meat. This is not, and you can cut it, and then you, if you bleed, you all of a sudden the life can disappear from you. Yeah, and it's all gone. It's like holy shit. There's this meat vehicle that some people have referred to as Lex. It's, I'm just a few stabbings away from. Like leaving. It, yeah, yeah, from leaving, goodbye. There's so, a soul that just flies away. Yeah, it, it used to be that we had to hang around, you know, people would come back from battle and we would hear things next to the campfire. As far as, oh, you stab somebody here and this happens. But now we live in an age where you can, you know, when I do a class, I this is this is a, a stab to the heart. And here's like five videos of it happening live, you know, on live leaks or whatever. And we can deconstruct that. Not only that, but... What weapon was used? Oh, it was a gas station folder. It was a pioneer woman knife from Walmart with flowers on the handle, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and the people start realizing that it doesn't take a lot, that it doesn't take a lot of training because a lot of these people are not high level assassins trained by ninjas in the hills or anything like that. They're people that you know, grew up rurally or learned by seeing that behavior in others. And when they start coming to the realization that it's pretty easy to do that, and they start figuring out like, how do you counteract that? Well, number one, learn the behavior yourself so you can recognize it. The whole aspect of being a good counter ambush team is to be a best, the, the best ambusher in the planet. So again, the whole aspect of Musashi saying, know your enemy, know his sword. You know, you figure that out as far as learning that behavior. You know, when you start seeing how some of these stabbings occurred, occur, the first thing you notice is that one of one of the hands is always kind of out of the picture, or there's a lack of symmetry in the people that are about to do something horrible. So when you see lack of symmetry in the environment, somebody with their hands going backwards, um, there's a crowd of people and some and a, and two or one individual is looking counter the, where everybody else is looking, or there's a hyper aware individual in a crowd. Uh, the hyper aware are always usually out there to fuck somebody over or are there trying to keep those predators from fucking somebody else over. So unless you step back and you put yourself in the process of learning how they learn and you become that potential nightmare person 
it's hard to recognize that in a, in a crowd. It feels like one of the significant ways to win or as a street fighter is to avoid it by sort of sending pacifist signals in every way, meaning avoiding the situation whenever there's like, uh, like a hypervigilant people, yeah. you just kind of avoid signaling that you're one of the players to, uh, of interest. Yeah. If we're talking about counter ambush, at which point do you do that versus shift to the aggression? Yeah, I think violence should be always an option. You know, everybody should have that option and you need to be good at that option. I think, uh, I think I heard Jordan Peterson talk about the fact that everybody needs to be dangerous, but keep that shit under control, you know? Yeah. I think he was referring to a different context, I, I but. Know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm referring to the ability of. The little physical conflict. Uh, as well. There's two cases that I saw of people just utilizing social engineering to a beautiful degree to de-escalate shit. Right. One guy. Uh, somewhere. First off, if you're in a place where people are grabbing your wife's ass or something like that, like, what are you doing there? You know, there's a, a load of things that are wrong with everything that you're doing in your life to be in that environment. But yeah, let's say you're in an ines inescapable situation. There was this guy who was in a compromised position. Uh, somebody wanted to fight him, uh, like legit kick his ass. And he said, okay, uh, I, I, let's go. But I, I just, I need to warn you that I have hep C before we go outside. And that- It's masterful. I was getting my phone out to, to, to film this, you know, maybe. Yeah. I, and even <laughs> I was just lowered my phone to, to, to give him a slow clap. That was a beautiful move, you <laughs> yeah. know? Um, and then there was this other man, uh, there, was a, there was a riot somewhere in, uh, uh, in Ensenada, uh, the, mun the municipality of Ensenada in Baja. They were protesting some of the, the people that pick those fields down there part of a tribe called Los Triquis. Very hardy, hardworking people, but nefarious people too. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty good at their thing. Um, there was a riot line they couldn't break. And this old man walks in the middle of the riot line and yells, grenade, and throws an avocado in the middle of all the cops. Mm -hmm. And all the cops, <laughs> you broke that riot line with an avocado. Uh, <laughs> oh, that could have gone wrong in so many ways. But it didn't. I don't know. To me, it, like it's, there's small lessons there. There is a case to be made about social engineering, about learning about behavior, about learning how to lie and how to kind of uh, move your way or navigate your way around situations like that. Small things like bartering, knowing how to bribe people in conflict zones is the thing that I, I, I show when I talk about or train people to work in hostile environments. De-escalation, you know specifically kind of figuring out what is a value in the environment, uh, what things you shouldn't be doing in an environment that might be considered disrespectful or out of place. You know, the people have a tendency that that didn't grow up in places that are violent to make continuous eye contact with somebody maybe, oh, yeah. that might be an issue or smiling when there's nothing to smile about. I think, uh, you know, uh, there's a picture I saw somewhere of Russians taking a, a a portrait and there's Americans there and the Americans are smiling, but the Russians aren't. Yeah. Because what is there to smile about? Which is true. And of course it's not as simple as smile or not smile. There's subtlety to it. Like you said, eye contact is a super interesting one because um, I found in my in my own life, like not making eye contact is, <laughs> other people would be joking, but it's a really powerful way for, to de-escalate. And there's such a fascinating thing though, because you, you could talk about drunk fights that are just, uh, that are harmless, but I feel like the same dynamic applies to the most violent conflict, including wars. I feel like ego is part of this. So to me, the question of conflict, whether it's a street fight or anything else, is the calculus of, are you willing to take an L? Yeah. Uh, in terms of psychology. Somebody grabs your wife's ass, you mentioned. Boy, if you let that happen, you go home, you're gonna have to pay the price of you were the person who didn't defend you. Like in your relationship, yeah. Yeah. you didn't defend your wife's honor. Yeah, You're gonna psychologically pay that price yourself. And depending on your wife, she might secretly also lose a little bit of respect for you. Yeah. Now, how you play that calculus? Because now we see the war in Ukraine. I would say there is elements of similar posturing in the United States, in in Europe, 
in, in uh, Ukraine, Russia, China, leadership. At a macro level. At a, mac at a geopolitics, it's still somebody grabs somebody's ass and you're not backing down. So to take those losses and basically just posture, you know, lower your head and live to fight another day type uh, situation. The thing with modern violence is, you know, the access to weaponry, uh, you know, and I mean, again, nobody owns life, but anybody can hold a frying pan can own death. I've seen people, um, you know, get double leg take down somebody on the ground. It's a different thing doing in the mats versus concrete. That's a good way to kill somebody, you know? Uh, the most prolific impact weapon on the planet is the planet itself. You can see various videos of people online where they fall and they hit their head or somebody hits their head and they go into, you know, this stretched out fit, basically. Uh, and that might not kill you then, but it'll kill you that night or the second night if you don't get checked out. You know, yeah. people bleed out internally, get an edema. Again, the whole aspect of me showing how some of these things not only some of these methodologies and somehow people prepare for violence and how people experience violence, how they make their weapons, how the people fight in the streets and stuff like that. It's to recognize that behavior from the inception, you know? Uh, there's a video I show where there's a bunch of street kids in Rio de Janeiro, I think it's during the Olympics, where they're snatching chains and cell phones from people. Mm -hmm. And it's a fun video, you know, see it. And it's uh, the first thing you learn about it is how they, target people. Now, who are they going after? There's a bunch of people there. Why are they going after that specific person? And you start learning about profiling and how they identify victim mentality, you know, or the, vic the perfect victim, you know, lack of awareness. They keep on a straight line, avoidance, avoidance of eye contact, if they're, you know, doing something nefarious or wrong, uh, and how they pick who they're gonna go after, you know, the small people, the, the women, you know, the, the, even some of the men, and they separate the men that they're perfect victims versus the men that's going to turn around and punch them in the face. You know, what are they looking for? You know, well, first off, you know, you, you notice that the, the men that are in that environment that look at them and are aware of their presence, the hyper aware are the ones that are not a good to target. So that's the first lesson there. So it's probably a good idea, not only to be hyper aware, but to recognize that hyper awareness in others. If I want to separate myself from the victim crowd. Another thing you notice is these are kids going after some grown adults. And some of these grown ad um, adult men are with women. And you see them, you know, kind of getting outside of the grasp of the, the these kids that are trying to rip their chains off their neck or their cell phones. And they have no consideration for the women around them. Uh, you see other men that are with women and you see them grab the women and put them behind them. And immediately they'll say, this, this is the wrong one. Let me move off to the next one. So that that small little lesson in that in those videos will show you first how these kids are growing up tar to to profile and target who the perfect victims are. That's a school for them. And that is an adversarial school. We should look at that school and apply it to ourselves. So in general, you think conflict ultimately the people that are doing conflict are looking for for weakness. I mean, they're looking for opportunity. You know, opportunistic, uh, that's the predators, that's what they do. They look for an opportunity, you know, uh, from jumping down from a tree and, and, and getting the, the slowest gazelle to uh, looking for the opportune moment to pounce on something that's probably big, but the risk is worth it. I feel like there's uh, several motivations, but but isn't, isn't there also a, a power hierarchy motivation as well? Yeah. Like you, there's something about the big guy that tempts you to send a message, especially with gangs, aren't they send, aren't they constantly uh, sort of trying to signal that they're the alpha? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a different situation. So you could be, you could be facing a sociopathic predator who is looking for something in you that you are the resource that they're looking after. Maybe it's a woman, you know? It could be a group of people that don't like the fact that you have a specific uh, nationality uh, or your passport is stamped in a specific way or that you pray to whatever God. All these have factor in, uh, but in the end, they all do the same thing. They look for an advantageous position. If I were to target you, I would put you in between that wall and you know me. So you have two avenues of exits, and I will step on one of your feet to keep that avenue closed. So you have to go this way. So this is where my knife is going to be. You see that behavior mirrored everywhere in the world. First off, you look for advantages, right? If it's something that's unavoidable, like you're in between me and my ability to go home, 
or you're in between me and my ability to feed my family, or you're in between me and my ability to posture to the people that are behind me, the young guys, that I'm in charge. I will do everything in my power to end you, right? Mm -hmm. The motivations are not my realm, but the ways they do it are, are you know, and the, basically the advantage part of it. So desperation is uh, is dangerous. It's a dangerous school. When I say dangerous school, I mean the most dangerous people usually come from those desperate environments. You know, you, you can have uh, people in Coronado holding on to logs in the ocean and go through this millions of dollars worth of training and just be professional killers uh, for the government and just be these incredible human beings. And then there's a kid that will walk up to one of them when he's off, you know, and uh, put an ice pick right into his chest uh, when he's least expecting it. And that doesn't mean that one is superior than the other. It just means that there are more, that there's more than one way to become that, you know. Teenagers terrify me. It feels like the intensity of desperation, like the capacity of a teenager, like 16, 17, to be desperate and also not have the matured understanding of ethics of the world. Like they have this intensity of feeling uh, that is unlike anything else. They don't have a volume knob to that. Yeah. So it's like, a, it's like a garden hose without a nozzle on it so you can regulate it. They haven't developed that. They haven't learned that maybe from somebody else, or you know, it used to be warrior cult cultures. You would you would be apprentice under somebody, or you would learn some of these things from other people. Even some gang, modern gangs have a little bit of that. But if you're not, and you're just this kid that's been playing Call of Duty uh, all, all of his life, or that has been witnessing violence and in, in media, and there's no sense of it's probably a bad idea to go off and do this because of all of these repercussions. I could see how that could be a danger to society. And some of the volume knobs, some of the countermeasures to people exploding on somebody else with a with, with a weapon, you know, that I, you see videos constantly online. I, I remember seeing this one of these two uh, teenage girls somewhere in the US and one of them just, there's a fight, there's a hair pulling competition and all of a sudden one of them takes out a knife. And it just happens like that. And it's just pure unrestrained downward stabbing. You know, you're like, wait, where does that come from? Well, uh, she's from an environment where she saw that as an option. She didn't see the repercussions of it. And she found herself in a place where she thought that was the only uh, viable option, pulling out a weapon. And that's, I think that's, that's the dangerous part of it. So how do you prepare... Uh, to win those kinds of situations, to escape those kinds of situations. Like you said, it's training, it's exposing your mind. I always tell people, like, if, if you don't have a combative base, you don't have a base, uh, boxing, jujitsu. And that, that gives you what, like an awareness of your body kind of thing? It gives you an awareness of your body, it gives you a spatial awareness. If, somebody, if, you, if you can't see the points with your peripheral vision, if you can't see the points of somebody's feet in your peripheral vision, they are in range to stab you in the heart if they wanted to. Yeah. And that's something you learn from boxing, that you learn from jujitsu, you learn from a bunch of combat arts where you you learn about distance and angling people. That comes from this experience that you have. You know, again, a lot of these things were just a horse play when we were growing up in some cultures or, you know, rough and tumble with your brothers and shit like that. But we're, some of us are growing up in single kid homes now and we don't get that, we were missing that. And if you don't have it, then you find it in the, you find it in a jiu-jitsu gym, you find it in a boxing gym, you have it, you find it in a Thai boxing gym, you find it in places where they specialize in focusing on certain aspects of this whole combative uh, hall, right? It used to be before UFC, you know, we, the Kung Fu man, you know, that Kung Fu guy, that's just street lethal shit. You, yeah. you can't use it in the sporting, con you can't show you this because it'll kill you. Now we pretty much know that most of that was you know, flights of fancy or BS, you know, it pains me too, man. I wanted to learn some of the D mock single punching and killing yeah. technique. You know, I remember those yeah. books, but that's just not I'm still the on the lookout for that. Yeah, maybe somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe if you put a pen in your hand, that, that might turn into that, but that's, yes. that's the only way, that's the only way. Right. But, uh, a lot of these myths are kind of like faded away. Now you see people that have different combative bases, 
combining them all and becoming a fighter. Now, that's a UFC fight, two people fighting each other is one thing. You know, you being in the middle of the Portland riots and a bunch of uh, state troopers throwing gas at rioters and then rioters themselves fighting each other and you finding yourself in the middle of that, that's a completely different thing. And if you think you're going to, you know, go on, go on the ground and get in a guard with a, with a, with a guy swinging around a, a, a shovel, a, a piece of a shovel handle, right? As tear gas is going on because you got uh, stopped there and your car was, you know, windows were broken and your family's in the backseat. You know, that is a different situation. So, you know, getting medical, uh, learning how to, learning about weaponry, you know, uh, I, I personally don't really like fighting on the ground, but that's why I forced myself to go to uh, train with different people out there, you know, uh, uh, on the ground, jujitsu, catch wrestling. So top and bottom, neither, you don't like either. I, I, pr yeah. I personally, I like being in a car and running everybody over. That would be great, you know, if I could, or driving really far away or, um, uh, I had this. I had this uh, experience in Utah. Uh, some fr some friends of mine, uh, military. Uh, some of your best shooters, uh, some of the best shooters in the U.S. You know, coming from the uh, the Marine Corps, were showing you were showing me how they you know would shoot something from really far away, and I was like, oh, you don't even have to be in the same vicinity. The scope of violence, how far you can be from it, or how close you could be from it. Just wait till we get to see what we can do in the cyber attack world. We can destroy your whole well-being, your whole life, your identity. That's another aspect of it too. Financial, and then uh, figure out where you live in terms of ambush. Yeah. Figuring out everything about you such that hurting you is easy. I have a class where we specifically de work on social engineering and kind of how 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 you can go about something that you know at a, a micro level. Uh, we I do a class with a guy named Matt Fiddler who does uh basically he he's one of the premier experts on how to get into and bypass locks basically. Uh, he'll we he'll show you how to open up every single or bypass every single commercial lock available in the United States. Like he'll spread it out and it'll open up everything, and that's like yeah. right. And my part in his class is I talk about how you can pull some of that off in a public space and not get caught or how you would employ some of these things in a context where it's like useful for law enforcement, for the military, stuff like that. And uh, so we have this exercise in a public space where there's a bunch of padlocks in the environment, mm -hmm. right? And they, they, we paint them pink so people know it's our padlocks and we're not breaking into anybody else's padlocks if we get approached and asked about it. But I asked the students, like, so you have to gather all these padlocks from this public space, you know? So how would you do it? So a lot of them are trying to pick them, you know? They're, like, very suspiciously picking them and stuff like that. They get caught, and it's a whole situation. But the smart ones will basically develop a social media campaign related to the padlocks, right? Um, a, a beautiful a beautiful example of this. And this actually happened here in Texas. I did a class out in uh, Dallas. We put the padlocks all over this public mall, and the students basically came up with a breast cancer awareness campaign online that they they made fake. Uh, well, they made flyers for it. They did the social media page on a campaign. They they did this email chain. So when they went there, people were expecting them. Mm -hmm. So they normalized the behavior through social media, and they were walking around with bolt cutters in the middle of a mall, cutting these things off. That's a beautiful. Yeah, that's a beautiful solution to a complex problem of that nature. And again, wep the weaponizing part of it, uh, anything can be, all knowledge can be weaponized. And it's, if you focus on getting in a street fight with somebody with your fist or a knife, you know, you're missing out on the whole complexity of violence and in, in, in the way that it's now being utilized.